Hi, I'm Karen McNeil, and this is Winespeed.com's People to Know, insider interviews with the most fascinating and important people in the wine business. And today we're here with Robin Lale, who is the proprietor of Lale Vineyards. And Robin, you come from, of course, a very important and deeply rooted winemaking family. Your great grand uncle was Gustav Niebaum, who founded Inglenook. And your father, of course, was John Daniels, who was so instrumental in the Napa Valley wine industry. How did they influence your passion for wine? Well, it's pretty easy, actually. And so when you're born into a situation, I, I feel like I am one of those people that was born in the right place at the right time, and I got really lucky. Mm. So as a, as a little girl, my dad um, did a lot of talking about our family traditions and the beauty of the property and the beauty of the wines and the importance of wine. and. Um, his views on it, and I became familiar with the story of Gustav Niebaum, which I've since learned um, through a lot of research that a lot of it was quite incorrect, <laughs> but, but mm. it doesn't matter at all. So mm -hmm. it was basically just being there and my dad being so passionate, and obviously Niebaum was enormously passionate as well. and. Those things, um, they're like a drip infusion, basically. Mm. And I think that you have no awareness of them taking over your heart, but they do. Yeah, mm. oh, I can imagine. Um, you know, in those days, in the early days, well, I'm thinking of when your father was running the winery in the 40s and 50s, it, um, it must have been quite cool, really, to be a, a a little kid hanging around. Do you remember the first wine you had? Oh, I do, and it wasn't when I was a little kid. And it was because my mother um, chose, she had been gone for several years and came home and um, decided that she would make things right. And so it was her idea to put my sister and I um, in the Mormon church, and that was the end of my mm. almost wine drinking. <laughs> yeah, oh dear. Which didn't really happen until, um, you know, I was in my late teens and early 20s. Mm. So, you know, the stories that we hear so often about people who are so embedded and passionate about this business, about about how they, you know, tasted wine with their father in the basement or in the <laughs> exactly. winery. And I, I always feel just a tad bit wistful and think, oh, <laughs> that would have been wonderful to do. Yeah. Uh, I, I do remember my first tasting with my father. I was um, 18, and he came down to uh, where I was going to school and took me to a tasting. I said, Dad, what do I do if the wine is just awful? And he <laughs> said, you, you smell the wine, you look at the wine, you smell the wine, then you look into the eyes of the man or woman standing across the table and say, that is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that advice still stands today. It certainly does. Yeah, it it certainly does. So I'm very offended if someone tells me our ones are interesting. <laughs> well, in your early career, of course, you, you worked with Robert Mondavi. And what was that like? What was it like working uh, for you know a man who is uh, legendary, of course. Well, it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. It was brilliant, and for many reasons. So, Karen, um, my dad was Robert Mondavi's mentor in the wine yes, business. Yes, that's right. And um, just recently, I've come to the idea that that Robert Mondavi hired me as his assistant because he was honoring his friendship with my dad, who was long gone. Mm -hmm. and um, was determined to get me fired up and having the courage to get back into the business mm -hmm. and pick up this wonderful, this wonderful story and this wonderful legacy that is mm -hmm. so unique and or just one of a kind. Yeah. And so working with him, he was my tutor. Um, he was my mentor, but he was also my tutor. So I was exposed. I had a very unsecretarial, secretarial job. And so I was um, enabled, enabled to go to all the, all the tastings, all the 
um, experiments in the laboratory, um, going to Europe for three weeks with the first Mandavi Odyssey, um, representing mm -hmm. Mandavi on um, one, we're on another aircraft going back and forth to Europe, just doing all kinds of things and having the opportunity to start the first auction in Napa Valley. Yeah. So it was an incredible experience and it wasn't just Bob, it was it was Margaret, yeah. and the two of them were so magical. And so today, my views about the wine business are certainly reflections of of Bob as well as my father and Margaret. You know, Margaret was the the woman I always wanted to be when I grow up. You know, yes. but you know, I could live to be a thousand, and it just wouldn't work out so well. <laughs> she was an enormously talented uh, and such an artistic visionary of a woman. Just absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Robert Mondavi, of course, but you then went on later to work with Christian Moex of Chateau Petrus, and, and you worked ultimately with Bill Harlan as well because of the auction um, and, and Meta Wood. And there aren't many women who have spent so much time working with famous men. And of course, you became famous too, but I'm wondering if a woman has to have a special knack or a skill to work with men who are they're, they're, you know, they're larger than life personalities. For me, I, I don't think it's a skill. I think it's a, it's a fascination. I would say that I am secretly a very driven human being and driven to be, to, to try to do something that is noteworthy mm. in life. And so as I was going through these incarnations with, with Bob Mandavi and uh, Christian and uh, Bill, um, there was so much information coming. You know, how many people get to think about going into the wine business and be, be able to uh, sit beside the chairman of the board and go to the board meetings. And I mean, it was just a remarkable, and I wasn't taking notes. So those men, were very important to me. No Bill Harlan, I wouldn't be who I am today. Mm. That's just plain and simple. And he was an individual who in a different incarnation, in a different format, um, really tried to help me to be all I could be. And it was tough. Oh, I know, he's demanding. Yeah. Well, all, all those relationships were very tough, and so not for the weak at heart, but yeah. fascinating and so instructive. And, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book, Karen, and the title of the book at the moment is, If It Doesn't Kill You. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yes. Well, I think uh, a lot of women will be reading that book. A lot of people will be reading that book. Um, you know, thinking about being driven to do things, though, I know you've also gotten involved with the Porto Protocol and... Um, that in fact you're the U.S. representative. Explain, explain to us what the Porto Protocol is. So the Porto Protocol is a, is a really outstanding initiative that was um, born at a conference in July in 2018 with the keynote speaker Barack Obama. And the purpose of the Porto Protocol is to serve as a collective as, is to serve as a burgeoning membership of people principally in the wine business but there are people from outside as well both individuals and other corporations but the idea is to to recognize the fact that we're out of time mm -hmm. that we're in a crisis of a climate crisis and that we don't have time to be reinventing the wheel so the idea is that in order to become a member of the protocol, you sign a letter of principles, which are very simple, basically all directed towards the climate, improving your footprint. Um, and you make an agreement that you will, in some way, either small or large, change the, the footprint that you're making on the, on the planet Earth for the better mm -hmm. in, in the coming year, years, whatever. And the, that those, that those studies, if you will, are on file 
And so they become a collective of information. And so now you, Karen, you want to go and do something, you know, in the wine business. And you, you don't really know where to start. And so you can look at these studies and it, either you can replicate one of them or it may serve as a springboard for a new idea for you to go forward. And so that's part one. And part two is that if you try to speak with people about climate change, it's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is I believe that it's so overwhelming for yeah. all of us you know, where do you, where do you put a stake in the ground? How do you start? How can you, you, me, how can we make a difference? So then it's so overwhelming, you just shut down. And so I think that it's very important also through this initiative. My hope is to, um, um, the vintners have joined the initiative. I'm very thrilled and Spotswood and Larkmead and um, there's a whole host of people coming along. And my job, as I see it, is to continue to bring people into the membership yeah. and um, to start here in Napa Valley and hopefully, if I have enough time, move on mm -hmm. um, throughout the state of California. And the purpose of that is to create a loud voice because we the people can make a change, mm -hmm. you know, and we forget that sometimes because our government issues are a bit um, out of whack, if yeah. I might say so, and um, it's just my own opinion. But So it's hard for people to remember that we can collectively change things. And a great example of that was the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. yeah. where the people took to the streets and called for a change. So that's, I hope that's clear or it's a reasonably big ambition. clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as you say, it, it's, it's, it starts with every individual beginning to take their steps and, and someone has to remind us all uh, to do that. So congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I feel, I feel very much like the um, dog who chased the car and caught it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Very good. Now, you, uh, you know, a few years ago, you started your own winery, Lale Vineyards, here in the Napa Valley with your daughters. You have two daughters, two adult daughters. And I'm wondering how you describe your own wines. I mean, you've been around so many great wines. How do you describe the Lale wines? Oh, that's just such a good question. <laughs> No one likes describing their own wine, by the way. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> so I would describe our, our red wines as having a, a degree of elegance and um, a very beautiful integration, exciting aromatics to uh, bring you to the glass and um, a beautiful integration of the wines and a lingering finish. And, I, I would frankly love to be able to move back a little bit in terms of the bounty of the, of the fruit that we get uh, to a little bit um, less um, luscious um, place. But I'm very thrilled with the wines. And I'm, I must tell you that, that imagine my temerity at the age of 55 with two and a half acres of Merlot, which is what I started with at Lale Vineyards, putting my father's name on our first bottle of wine, J. Daniel Cuvet. And um, this has been a fascinating journey and happily I love challenges and there mm. have been a lot and it's been really rewarding. And so when you finally arrive at a point where your peers, um, and the critics um, view your wines favorably. Um, it's a wonderful affirmation. Mm, I don't know how to explain it particularly. And having said that, if someone calls or sends an email and says, we had an amazing bottle of your wine last night and we were with la la friends or whatever. And for me, every one of those calls or emails or communications, telephone calls, is like a present. It's mm -hmm. like this beautifully wrapped present. Here, you know, here's three years of your life spent developing mm -hmm. this, and here's a gift. So, um, so my wines, I, I, I love our wines. I do, I'm very proud of them. 
Um, I hope uh, pardonably so. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm happy, I'm so happy, Karen, that I, that there was enough push that I finally had the, mm. the nerve to start over with pretty much nothing. So mm. I'm so glad. <laughs> well, speaking of starting over um, with, with very little or nothing, um, you have been incredibly and continue to be very successful. What, what character trait do you have that has allowed you to be so successful? I'm an optimist. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm an optimist, and so, so I'm like the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can. And I have gone through periods in our development where financial, my financial advisors have said, you're going to go bankrupt, you have to stop making wine. Mm -hmm. And I have said, no, we'll be all right, and, and we have been. And that is due to the true quality and um, magical ability of, of Philippe Melka, who I've worked mm -hmm. with for 24 years. Um, good, very good fruit. And um, an amazing team of people, in, in little team of people in my office who have always stood tall. And nobody, you know, even when things got very scary, and believe me, they did, mm -hmm. not more than, m more than once. Mm -hmm. um, so that optimism of just believing and keeping your eye, keeping your eye on, the, on the prize, you know, you have to, you cannot always and rarely, as a matter of fact, go straight to the prize. Right. So you have to be willing to drive these rather arduous roads and just keep your eye out there and keep saying, that's what we're going to do, that's what we're going to do. And then slowly by slowly, by surely, hopefully surely, not so surely, I don't know who surely is, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> slowly, you, you begin to make progress, and I do mean slowly, it, it was long. But you know, Robert Mondavi had this collection of homilies that I absolutely loved, and one of them was, it's all in how you look at things. And so sometimes when things get extremely difficult, if you can jockey your mm. vision, just a few microns, oh, it's remarkable how differently you can see things and see through, see through the woods to, you know, to the path on the other side. So mm. optimism and temerity and, um, and stubbornness. <laughs> and wisdom, I'll add. Robin, you're just an incredible uh, mentor and a wonderful, wonderful hero, really, of the wine business. Our full interview with Robin Lael appears on winespeed.com's People to Know page. Check it out. You'll really want to read it.